Let's get started in Matthew chapter 5. We're going back to uh, continuing on in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. And we got, we slowed, we're slowing way down because we're just taking these, uh, what they call the Beatitudes, one at a time. Okay, so we talked about, uh, we gave, gave an overview and then we talked about being poor in spirit. Last week we talked about they that mourn. So now we're at verse 5. So Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And that's what we're talking about this morning. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Go to Numbers chapter 12, if you would. Numbers 12. We know from the Bible that Moses was a meek man. In fact, look at Numbers 12, verse 3. This is in parentheses here, and it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. It doesn't say, you know, the meekest man that ever lived necessarily, but up at that time, he was the meekest man upon the face of the earth, earth according to the Bible. How would you like that to be said of you? That'd be an interesting uh, uh, thing to, for somebody to say, the meekest man. When you look back through the life of Moses from the beginning to the end, can you always see that and say, well, he was meek? Well, we'll talk about that uh, this morning. And of course, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, of course we see that Jesus was meek. And uh, just like he said about John the Baptist, that he was the greatest man born of woman, uh, Jesus said that. What a great honor for John the Baptist to, to have that said of him. But of course we know that Jesus was greater than John the Baptist, but, uh, but he wasn't speaking of himself. He was, you know, besides him. Same could be said about Moses, right? And obviously Jesus was the meekest man, but, uh, but Moses is mentioned in the Bible. So Matthew uh, 11, verse 29, the song we just sang a minute ago uh, Used part of this verse. Jesus says, Take, uh, let's ver look at verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, probably everyone in here knows what a yoke is. But if you team up two oxen, and uh, well, obviously we have tractors now, but back in the, in the day, if they were going to use the oxen to pull something that would till up the ground or make a row or whatever, and then they would have to join these two oxen together, so they put on their neck what's called a yoke. And uh, many have maybe seen that uh, hung up in your favorite country restaurant or something like that, an old-fashioned yoke. <laughs> and that's what they would put on the neck of the two uh, uh, oxen, and that would join them together. And so Jesus is saying, hey, take up that yoke. Join with me. And you say, well, I don't know if I could do that. You know? And he says, well, actually, my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Uh, okay, but, he all, but, but in that passage, he says this, for I am meek and lowly in heart. So was Jesus meek? Uh, well, let's look at what the, first of all, the definition is. Of course, it says, blessed are the meek. All right, so obviously two parts of this lesson uh, or this message, if you will. Blessed are the meek. The second part is, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay, so number one, blessed are the meek. Let's look at the definition of meekness. Straight out of the dictionary here, I think it was Webster said this, meekness, gentle, of, gentle or mild of temper, forbearing under injury or annoyance, humble, and then it says unassuming. So those are the characteristics of somebody who is meek. Uh, and we can apply that into the Bible usage of the word meek for sure. Gentle or mild of temper, forbearing under injury or annoyance, humble or unassuming. And I just want to break that down a little bit more and go over those because I think that's a great definition that we can learn from. But number one, how about gentle? So if Moses was the meekest man that was alive at that time, and the Bible makes mention of that, was Moses gentle? 
Well, I mean, you can think of Moses. He obviously was a manly man. He obviously had great strength. At one point, had great power, it seems, as a, of authority over his people back when he was in Egypt. And we know the story how in a certain time, and I won't even talk about all the details, but he killed a man with his bare hands. Well, that was that meek? We know that Moses, when he came down from the mountain, and it's, it's funny because God had told him, I've told this story a lot, and many are familiar with it, I know, but God had told him, the people, while you're up, while you're up here, and I'm giving you the Ten Commandments and all, the people are down there building a golden calf. And he says, I'm just going to wipe them out. I'll start all over with you. And Moses is praying, no, Lord, please, you can't do that. You can't wipe them out. And he's interceding on their behalf, which is what Moses often does when people come uh, accusing him or slandering him or, or treating him wrong or doing evil. Oftentimes he's praying on their behalf and interceding. So there's the meekness part, right? I mean, there's the gentle part of it. But then we see him coming down the mountain, and when he sees it for himself, and he hears the people shouting, he sees them dancing, and apparently they're naked. Uh, to what extent, I don't know, but we're, he says it's a shame unto all the enemy that might be seeing around. And he's mad, he's angry, and so here's gentle Moses, ready? Gentle Moses takes that golden calf, grinds it into powder, puts it in the drinking water, makes the people drink it. He lines them all up, and he says, who's with me? Who's on the Lord's side? He says, grab your swords and kill your brother. <laughs> That's a gentle, meek Moses, right? <laughs> but he was gentle. Think about it. On behalf of these people, he's going before God. He's not trying to get even with them. He's not trying to, uh, uh, you know, hey, they did me wrong, and so now I'm going to do it. His anger was righteous. His anger was because these guys have blasphemed God's, I mean, God's name. These guys have done wicked. Uh, they've become a shame to all of the surrounding nations and to their enemies. And they've done this, scoffed at the Lord's name, and he was righteously angry and upset at the wickedness of the people. So, yeah, he was gentle when it was right for him to be gentle. And when he had to be strong and powerful and, uh, and, and, and sometimes does, didn't seem so gentle, he was. The same could be said of Jesus, right? We know he is meek, and he said so himself, I'm meek and, uh, and lowly in heart. And so what about those times? Everybody knows this about Jesus, though, the time he goes into the temple, he says, this is my father's house. This is prayer supposed to be going on here. Worshiping of the Lord supposed to be going on here. This is his house. And he looks and he sees these wicked men in there using God's house for gain, merchandise, selling things. Uh, a whole lot I could say about that. And he got upset. You see him later. He's, he's got a whip in his hand. He's whipping them. He's turning over the tables. And you say, hey, what happened to that gentle, meek Jesus? Well, he's, he's still meek. He's still meek. It's just that this was a time of righteous indignation. He had to be powerful when he was powerful, so he, but he still was gentle. Now, number two is going to explain uh, uh, this a little bit further. The second definition, the second part of the definition was he was mild of temper. Mild of temper. You know, I'm pretty sure, I, I think I'm right on this, but uh, that, that scripture that I looked at it, uh, earlier in uh, Numbers about Moses being the, the meekest man, I believe that is right at the time when Aaron and Miriam are giving him a hard time about the lady that he married. Right? She was Ethiopian, and they were giving him a hard time. And, uh, and so God actually rebukes them. God punishes them for... Uh, uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I could be wrong on this, but Ethiopian, from what we understand from the Bible, they were very dark-skinned, right? And if you remember what the curse for Miriam's, Miriam's curse after, you know, uh, uh, giving Moses a hard time and saying that he shouldn't be married to this lady, do you remember what her curse was? She got leprosy and her skin was white. <laughs> I think that's pretty interesting. Almost like it's saying, okay, so you like your white skin so much? <laughs> Here. But anyway, that's just something that I was throwing in there. But, but even during this time, I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm right. I, I, I'm sorry I, didn't, I wasn't prepared for that, but I think I'm right. Uh, that's during that same time. 
when, Mos, uh, when God's interceding on Moses' behalf and says, hey, he is the meekest man. Well, so what does he do during that time? He prays for Aaron and for Miriam. Later on, uh, how about Korah and his uh, cohorts? They come together and they they're kind of are rebelling against the system, if you will. And they challenge Moses and they say, look, you know, you've taken too much money. You think you're something and all this. And really, we should be running things just as much as you should be and what have you. And you say, Moses, what did he do? Did he bash their heads together? Did he, did he beat them up or whatever? No, he falls on his face before the Lord and he prays for them. Right? And God takes care of them. God is the one who gets vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. We've always got to trust that the Lord is going to be the one that gets even for us, okay? So meekness is not just being gentle. It's also being mild of temper. Uh, you know, you could fly off the handle. You could get upset. You could beat somebody up. Uh, but you are able to control that. When it's right and you know it's in God's hands and you know it's not your job to stand up and do that, then you can bite your tongue or whatever it is that you need to do. Jesus the same way. I mentioned Jesus turning over the tables and having a whip, but let's, uh, let's go ahead and look at John chapter 2. John chapter 2. I was just going to tell you, but I think we ought to read this. It's easy to uh, throw that scripture out there to, to paint Jesus. And don't get me wrong, he was, a, he was a manly man and he took care of business when business had to be taken care of uh, in such a way. But we always see that he was mild of temper and the Bible shows us that, John chapter 2, verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brother and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the table. So it's not like he just went and grabbed the closest thing he could find and started swinging it and beating the people, he actually sat down and began to form this whip, if you will, and to make it, right? So it was like he had time to think about it. I've got to do this. You know, my, his natural tendency is to be gentle, to be meek, but something had to be done, so it was a kind of a different situation. It's not like he just lost his temper. He was mild in temper, right? He's a meek uh, man. And so then another thing was this, forbearing under injury or annoyance. Forbearing <laughs> under injury or annoyance. From time to time, I have my patients tried with somebody who might try to harm me uh, in some way. I'm not even talking about like physically harm, but like do some kind of damage to me. Or somebody who's just annoying. Anybody ever have... <laughs> Someone in their life that's just kind of an annoyance. And what you want to do is just say, look, I don't have time for you. Get out of here. Right? You're annoying me. Go. Be gone. <laughs> but the Bible says if you're going to have meekness, you've got to be able to say, uh, you're going to, you have to be able to forbear some of that. Okay? But there's a time, right? There's a time to stand up and say, look, you know, I, I've got to lay down the law. I've got to do X, Y, Z. And so you don't just end up being that kind of guy that just lets everybody walk over you, but you learn how to forbear some annoyance and wait for the right time. Pray about it. Seek the leadership of the Lord on a matter and not just fly off the handle and do something just the moment it, it, it irritates you. That's meekness. All right. Forbearing under injury or annoyance. And of course, the Sermon on the Mount is going to have a whole lot of other stuff about this, talking about, you know, smiting some, somebody smites you in the cheek, then you turn to the other cheek and all that kind of stuff. Someone asks you to go a mile, go with them two miles, you know, forbearing. All right, that's meekness. And then part of the definition was just humble. I mean, really, this is what it comes down to. Meekness is just humility, not putting yourself above everything, uh, and, then not, and then unassuming, not assuming the worst about people and jumping to conclusions uh, and thinking that you know what's right and what's best all the time, but being able to, uh, to, uh, to wait on others and be patient. 
So we wonder then how uh, and why a person who is meek is blessed. I mean, in, the, in this life especially, you think about that. And I'm going to tell you this. Here is a principle that I, you can't get around. Okay, this is just the fact of the matter. Nice guys finish last. <laughs> they do. They just, they, nice guys finish last. If you're just trying to be nice, and look, the Bible says, as much as lies within you, be peaceful with all men. We should try to have peace. We should try to be nice. We should try not to go out there and just be, you know, hey, well, I don't really care what people think. I'm just going to do this. That's not how we should be. But when you try to be nice to one person, you often have another person who doesn't like the fact that you're nice to that person, okay? And so you try to say, whoa, let me be nice to this person then because they they're not happy with me at that time. Now that person doesn't like you anymore. And you just can't win. So you're good. you have to just follow the Lord and try to be peaceable with all men. Try to be, uh, try to the best that you can just to be nice and to, uh, but, you know, and I say nice, that doesn't mean you, there's not a time to lay down the law or what have you, but just try to do that and not worry. You're, you're letting God take care of the rest. Now, remember, this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is God, uh, this is Jesus preaching to his disciples, not just everybody who just wants to be saved and wants miracles and wants bread and all that kind of stuff. This is him saying, look, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to live like this. You're going to have to endure this. You're going to have to that. And you will be blessed as a result of it. Many of those blessings will come right now for living that way and God just giving you that peace in your heart. But some of these blessings are going to come later on. Okay, so let's look at this. First of all, the Bible uses this concept of the meek inheriting the earth in other places. Let's go to Psalm 37. Psalm 37 starting in verse 7. He says this, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth uh, in the way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath, Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. All right, what's that mean? Well, we're going to get to that in a second, but he's saying be patient. Wait, just keep doing what the Lord tells you to do. Don't try to take matters in your own hand and say, no, this is the way it's supposed to be. You let the Lord deal with it, and you continue to live humbly, and what does it say? And to wait upon the Lord forsake wrath, cease from anger, all these things that naturally you're going to want to do. He says, don't do that, and God's going to bless you. Look at Psalm 22 now. Back up to Psalm 22, 26. You'll recognize these words. <clears throat> the meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him your heart shall live forever. Uh, that's a good verse, but that's not the one that I meant to find. <laughs> but still, uh, the meek shall be satisfied with heavy. The, there's a, one of the Psalms, flat out says the exact words that Jesus says, the meek shall inherit the earth. And I might have overlooked that or something. But it, it's not important. We're going to move on. But So the Bible concept of the meek on a later day inheriting the earth is, is just all throughout the Bible. <clears throat> now, first of all, let's, let's talk about this. There is a just secular application that can be applied. Obviously, like I said, nice guys, they just finish last. Let's be honest. In the, in all, in the real world, under the sun, they're not the ones that are going to be recognized. They're not the ones that everybody's going to love. Uh, the Bible makes it clear Really, if everybody just loves a guy, he's probably not doing something right, <laughs> right? And it says, that all that love the Lord and, uh, and want to live godly, it says they'll suffer persecution, right? Because that's just the natural, because the natural man doesn't receive the things of God. And so when somebody tries to live 
according to the Word of God, naturally it, it's a repellent. And that's what we talked about this morning about lifestyle evangelism. It's important for us to maintain good works and to live right and to do the best that we can so that others might see. But look, they're not naturally drawn to that. Now, when they get in trouble and their wife left them and, and they have a drinking problem or a drug problem and their life has fallen apart, they'll turn to you because they know you have the answers. But when everything's going all right, they're like, hey, you're not going to go to the bar with us? No, no, no. I'm just going to go home to my family and I'm going to do this and that. They're like, ah, ha, ha, ha. They're, that's not naturally drawn to you. And that's why I don't understand the world's philosophy of reaching the world by being like the world. That doesn't make sense. Well, we're just going to get some bands in here, and, and it'll have Christian words, but the music's got to sound like their, their music, and then they'll come into the church, and that music will get them in, and it'll draw, and then they'll say, oh, I like this, and it's Christian music, and then they'll, they'll be lifted up, and they'll, they'll, they'll turn to God. No, they didn't. What you just did is open up a door for them to, be ex to just accept their natural way of life and just throw the name Jesus on top of it, right? And that's not, that's not being a disciple and living for the Lord. Right? If you're going to live for the Lord, you're naturally probably not. Look, God, good godly hymn music, now some of it's beautiful. right? And even the world will recognize that. But it's not natural for people to just be like, you know what, I just want to hear some hymn singing today. <laughs> now if you say, well, I like that, well, yeah, because you're saved. But it's not natural for the world to just hear somebody singing a special up here with a hymnal or something like that. Or the whole congregation just singing that, and they say, oh, you know what, can I get a CD of that? I really want to play that in my car as I'm driving down the street. It's just not, right? It's not a natural uh, attraction to the world. So, so there is this spiritual application, though, that if you continue to be meek, I mean, a, a secular application, I mean, if you continue to be well-tempered, because let, uh, let's be honest, in this life, anybody that flies off the handle and, and, and reacts harshly to something, is, it's going to, they're going to reap from that, right? They're going to reap from that. If, they get, if, if, if as soon as you give them something to do uh, or tell them something, they just yell at you and they have no patience and they're just ugly about it or whatever, well, next time when you come to give them something to do, you know, you're going to be real hesitant. So in the business world, the person that will just do the job, endure, you know, people talking about them or endure people gossiping or whatever. They just forget that and they'll keep working. Whether they're a Christian or not a Christian, in this life, they probably will pr be prospered. Somewhere down the road, the boss is going to see them and all the other people said, oh, that guy's good at two shoes. You know, he's the, he's the teacher's pet or he's the boss's pet or whatever. And he's just doing all this. Yeah, yeah. But in the end, guess who's laughing? Because they're the one that's going to climb the ladder. All right? and that's the secular world. I'm not talk, talking about uh, uh, the biblical principle. I'm just saying that even living this lifestyle of saying, look, I'm just going to control my mouth, control my anger, live temperate, put up with some things, forbear some evil in this world, it'll go a long way in helping you to reap uh, the, the benefits. But uh, obviously when he says the meek shall inherit the earth, we're talking about a future promise. There's a future promise. When shall the meek inherit the earth? How do we inherit it? What's the inheritance like? These kinds of questions we might ask. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Let's look at verse 10. Now, read, read along. This is really good. I don't want to put anyone to sleep or bore you, but, uh, but just pay attention to what he's saying here. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Now, obviously, our body, in our bodies, we're going to do wrong. Sometimes we're going to sin. Sometimes we're going to be judged according to that. But look, we're talking about the blessings for somebody who follows the Lord. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. 
But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What's an heir? Somebody who gets the inheritance, right? We, are, we have an inheritance coming to us, according to this chapter. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, so you might read that and say, okay, wait, so only, this, only if you suffer are you going to inherit. You know, so somebody might jump to conclusions and say heaven. Like, oh, you're not going to go to heaven unless you do the works and you, you know, just give your life all to the Lord, and you do everything that he tells you to do, and you, and you, don't, you try not to sin, and you, you, no, that's work salvation, and you don't find that in the Bible. But there's some sort of inheritance that we're going to talk about in a minute. There's some kind of extra blessing. There's something that you receive based on how meek you are in this earth, based on how much you're willing to suffer in this earth, based on what you're willing to sacrifice, what you're willing to give up, all those kinds of things, do you think that the creator of this world, do you think that Jesus who died on the cross for your soul, he's not going to want to reward you for the works that you do? And when he sees you suffering in this earth and you say, God, where are you? You know, Why are you letting me go through this? Why are you letting me, people treat me this way? Why are you letting all that? You know he hears you. You know he wants to reward you, but he's waiting. And in his time, he will reward you. And you might, it might not be in this life. It might be afterwards, but you can rest assured he rewards you. You say, well, everybody gets to go to heaven when they die. Yeah, but some people are going to be rewarded greater than others. If that's not your motivation, great. I've heard people say, oh, uh, your motivation for serving the Lord shouldn't be based on the works that he's going to give you, or else that's not true love for the Lord. Well, maybe not. <laughs> but if he says, if you do this and this and this, I'm going to reward you one day, I'm going to do it, right? Because I want reward. <laughs> you say, I've heard people say, oh, you shouldn't just, you shouldn't trust Jesus in order to get you out of hell. You should just trust Jesus because you love him. And then that shows that you are truly saved. Well, what are you being saved from? You're being saved from hell. That means that you're going to die and go to hell. And he says, oh, don't you want to be saved? Yes, I want to be saved. Yeah, no, I don't want to die. And then you can be saved. Look, we are selfish individuals. We get saved because we don't want to die and go to hell. <laughs> we do the works only because we know the end result is that we're going to be blessed. <laughs> you know, you dangle the carrot out in front. A carrot won't do much for me, but maybe a donut or something like that. Hang that out in front of my head, and I'm going to do lots of work trying to get that prize, right? And God knows that we're that way. Jesus knows we're that way. So he says, on this earth, do the work. Work harder. I promise you I'm going to bless you for it. Give up more. I promise I'm going to bless you for it. Now, look, he's not saying that you have to, you know, live in misery your whole life. No, in fact, you're happy, you're blessed if you do these things, right? That's what this whole chapter is about. It's just some people have a hard time realizing how that blessing can come. So where are these blessings? What are they going to be like? If everybody goes to heaven, you know, what are, what are my rewards that I get for enduring in this life and, and, and for being meek and what have you? And I can say, number one, I don't know. <laughs> Number two, I can tell you what I think, okay, and what seems to make sense and seems to be consistent in the Bible. Turn to, chap turn, turn to the book of Luke. Now, Luke is a parable that Jesus gives, and anytime Jesus gives parables, you don't want to take that to the extreme where you get some kind of crazy doctrine or, or you start clear statements in the Bible. You know, you start saying, well, that can't be true because of this parable. No, a parable is a story. Right? It's got a heavenly application, it's got a spiritual meaning to it, but it's a story, okay? And I just, I try to say that every time I, uh, I, we look at a parable, just because it kind of helps us remember that, not to get distracted. But Luke chapter 19, 
is a parable you've heard many times about the talents. All right, so one man's given ten talents, another's given five, another's given one. You're familiar with that story. The one that has five, you know, he takes it out and invests it, and, 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 and he's able to make, uh, uh, he's able to double that. Okay, I'm probably giving the wrong figures because a similar story is told elsewhere and it uses different numbers. So anyway, let's look at that before I mess it up too bad. Luke chapter 19. Uh, Luke chapter 19, but I want to just go to verse 15. Uh, Luke 19, verse 15. And it came to pass, he's telling this parable, that when he was, re- okay, I'm sorry. So, so, the, so the master gives them these talents and he says, hey, I'm going to come back. And when I come back, I want, I want to see that you have done something with what I gave you, okay, is, the, is in essence what he does. Okay, in verse 15, and it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants and called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good uh, servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, uh, have thou authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. So sorry what I was saying about the talents. This is a slightly different uh, parable. Uh, he gives them the pound, and these guys do st- something with the pound that he gives them. And he said, likewise unto him, verse 19, be thou also over five cities. All right? So the one guy, he got ten pounds, and he's over ten cities. The other guy, he gets five pounds, and he's over five cities. Verse 20, and another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere, austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knowest that I, am an, I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping what I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that as my, at my coming I may have required mine own with usury? And he said unto them that stood by, take, him, take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that every, uh, unto every one which hath shall it be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. Now, in our society... Uh, we very much are influenced and we, all the propaganda out there and everything towards like a socialistic mindset. It says everybody ought to be kind of equal. And if this guy has more, then he should give some of what he has to this guy that has less so that they can be kind of equal. All right? That works in this world to some degree. And Jesus even recommended it. The early church practiced it. It was never something that was enforced upon them, but they said, hey, if you got two coats and your brother doesn't have any, give him one of your coats, right? That's a good principle. But when we go into the kingdom of God, that's not the case. When you go to the kingdom of God, that person who worked hard, that person who put, them, put what God gave him aside and used it for good and did the most with it, what happens? He gets double what the other people get. Now, I don't know in heaven are we going to be like, oh, look, you only have one kingdom and I have ten kingdoms. Here, let me have, give you one of my, ki- one of my cities. <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't think it's going to work that way. And it doesn't matter, but the point is this. That, and again, it's a parable. I'm not trying to twist it. But the point is this, that one day we're going to be rewarded for what we do on this earth. Now, you might not care. You might say in the millennium. I really don't care what I do. I'll, I'll sweep the streets. That's all right with me. I'll be a janitor. The rest of my, and maybe that would be fine. But if there's a possibility of getting some rewards and getting something extra that God would bless me with and say, hey, you're faithful. I want you to, I want you to be a servant and do even more for me uh, and to be blessed twice uh, as much as everybody else or something like that, I'm going to give it a shot. Right? That's what we, what we should do. So here is the, uh, what I'm trying to say. What is the inheritance? Now, look, honestly, I don't know much about what happens in eternity after the millennium. I know very little about what the millennium is like, according to the Bible. I just kind of trust by faith that the little bit of information he gives us, uh, you know, is is enough to go over. 
And now, no tears, right? You read Revelation chapter 21, no sorrow, no death, no pain, no sin, eternity with God the Father and the Son. Uh, we all get that if we're saved. I don't know to what degree. Again, this, we're talking about eternity. We all get that. But there's going to be something in between eternity and now, all right, after we die and eternity. And that's something called the millennial reign of Christ. Revelation 20, you can read that if you want to know more about it. And there's other places in the Bible that make reference to it. There's this 1,000 year reign. Now, compared to eternity, 1,000 years isn't very much. But I've only been alive 41, almost two years. And to me, a thousand years is a long time. So there's something about this thousand years that I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to. Now, eternity, we got that settled. Uh, if you're saved, you're going to be part of that millennial kingdom. I believe that. But what are you going to get to do? What's your life going to be like in that millennial kingdom? I don't know, but there's some rewards to be given out. And I'm not going to take you to that chapter right now uh, that, that talks about the millennial kingdom. But I will say this, there is very much, uh, uh, it, is, it is very much, uh, well, I am going to look at, let's, let's go to Isaiah 11. And it's very much like the conditions of the Garden of Eden, according to the Bible. Where everything was perfect on this earth. God made it perfect, right? And then we messed it up because of sin and what have you. But it appears... We're going back to that time. And if you remember, in Genesis, people lived to be about a thousand years. And it appears like we're going back to that time and people are going to have long lives. Uh, I'm talking about those who are, are immortal. I mean, those who are mortal. We'll be immortal, so we'll live forever. But, uh, but there will be those on the earth that are back in those conditions like, like pre-flood, like, and actually pre-fall, into like Garden of Eden type uh, conditions. Isaiah 11 tells us a little bit about that. Go there, if you will. And, th uh, and I'm closing things up here. So, so notice, if you will, something out of this. Isaiah 11. I want you to notice the wording here. It brings us all to a conclusion. As soon as I find it. Isaiah chapter 11. All right, let's start at the beginning. Again, Old Testament, some of the pictures are unclear to us. We understand, we, we don't have it all figured out exactly, but, uh, but we can read this and God gives us some things to go off of. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. We know it's talking about Jesus, but at this time, Jesus hadn't come yet, the first time. All right, so uh, we, we go ahead and establish that. But still, what we're talking about is going to refer to the millennial kingdom. Verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and it shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after uh, the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove the equity for the meek." See that? Reprove, I mean with equity, sorry. Reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. You wouldn't see a wolf and a lamb dwelling together nowadays, right? But in this time, they'll dwell together, harmless. They're not killing, you know, the wolf's not eating the lamb. The leper shall lay down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of an asp, that's a type of snake. And the weaned child shall put his hand upon the cockatrice's den. They shall, not hurt nor they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
So we see all these great things that, are, that the millennial kingdom is going to be like, but I want you to go back there and see that verse again where he says, I will reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. I, I, I think what that's saying, if I'm understanding right, in context and uh, uh, reviewing all these other things that the Bible talks about regarding the meek of the earth, is look, one of these days, the millennial kingdom... Look, God said, he gave us his law, and he said, do these, and I'll bless you accordingly. And nobody ever did those things. So we really don't know what happens if we follow God's will perfectly. We really don't. But when Jesus is ruling and reigning on the earth, we won't have a choice but to follow his, his ways, right? Or else we'll be punished. And when we follow his ways, we'll find out, hey, everything works perfect, now, again, we're, we're immortal at that time because we've already been saved, and we're inheriting the earth, right? But what he's saying is, look, here's what I'm doing on, the, on those who would be wicked or whatever. I'm reproving with equity. You know, I, I'm, it reminds me of the, the time of tribulation in, in Revelation where they say, how long, Lord, before you repay? And he says, hey, just wait a little bit longer. Wait a little bit longer, and I will repay all right, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to reprove the wickedness of this earth. You will one day be able, now I'm not talking about just a desire to gloat necessarily, but you will one day for everything that you've been wronged for in this earth, everything that where people treated you wrong or you gave something up or you had to endure some persecution or some suffering, one day you'll stand by and say, man, God has paid me so many times over more than what I endured on the earth for a small period of time. And you'll be able to look and you'll be blessed and you'll be comforted and you won't even think for a second about, oh, I just suffered so much on that earth, you know, during the, you know, before uh, the millennial kingdom. No, no, no. In fact, I believe what we'll probably say is, man, I could have done so much more. I could have given up so much more, served the Lord so much greater, you know, worked a little bit harder and received even more blessings from the Lord. Look, I don't know if that sounds selfish or what, but here's what I know. There's a principle all throughout the Bible about reaping and sowing. And whatever you sow on this earth, you will reap, right? Now, thankfully, Jesus paid for our sins. We don't have to reap the punishment that our sins bring us. But what we can do is reap from those good things that he's wanting to bless us for. And in uh, one day, we will reap from those things. And so, be meek now. Be poor now, poor in spirit, we talked about. Be, uh, uh, do all these things that we see in Matthew chapter 5. Do it now as a servant of God, as a, uh, as a disciple of Christ, and you will reap later uh, whenever he hands out his rewards. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the blessings uh, that you give in this life, but nothing compared to what we receive in heaven, Lord. The things that we give up in this life or the things that hurt us or people have done us wrong, betrayed us, whatever the case, Lord, so little compared to the blessings of eternity. Help us to do more, uh, to walk worthy. Uh, we'll never be worthy uh, of all the blessings you've given us, but to try uh, to live uh, because we know we're in debt, great debt to you, Lord. I pray that you'll uh, help every one of us be encouraged by this sermon and to be uh, motivated to do more for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.